PMS, pregnancy, menopause. Each stage of womanhood has its unique challenges. That's why Highlands Natural's new women's multivitamins are formulated with essential daily nutrients, plus targeted support for your life stage. Facing PMS, there's a Highlands Multi for that. Navigating pregnancy and morning sickness, that too. In the throes of menopause, our formula is here to support you through hot flashes and skin changes. Gone are the days of juggling multiple supplements or guessing what you might need. With Highlands Naturals, it's one multivitamin with daily essential nutrients and science-backed ingredients to support you. An all-in-one wellness solution to lighten the load for women? Highlands Naturals is here for it. Find your multi at Amazon or Highlands.com. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D-S dot com. Highlands Naturals. We're here for it. Attention car shoppers. Right now at South Carolina Federal Credit Union, you can get a new or used auto loan and pay nothing until 2024. And no payments for 90 days means nothing out of pocket going into the new year. Plus, we have flexible rates and terms, so you could make the best financial choice for you. Learn more at scfederal.org slash autoloans. That's scfederal.org slash autoloans. Certain restrictions apply. Existing South Carolina Federal Credit loans are excluded. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello, thank you for logging in to listen to another edition of Space Nuts. Great to have your company. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley, and this week we will be looking at the results of a 16-year study into Einstein's theory of relativity. They've released the uh, results, and it might not come as a surprise to some people, although uh, it might come as a surprise to Einstein himself because he's looking, uh, he, he always thought there were holes in his theory and um, he, yeah, we're waiting to see if someone can find them. Well, we have the answer. Uh, and the process, the process involved in that is, is very interesting as well. So we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, we'll also look at a uh, fairly young star, well, it's younger than the star that we orbit. Uh, it's called E.K. Draconis, the dragon star. And it's uh, basically given us a bit of a, a look at uh, what the early solar system might have been like. Good thing we weren't around. Uh, and Comet Lenny, Comet Leonard uh, is headed our way and uh, they're not sure if it's going to survive, but we'll see what we can find out about that. Uh, also, uh, audience questions from Ben wanting to know about the energy of the universe. Uh, John, uh, about the launch of the Webb telescope, the James Webb telescope, and James uh, about odd radio circles. So we'll bump all that off in today's edition of Space Nuts. And of course, joining me as he does every week, whether he likes it or not, is the good <laughs> Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hi, Andrew. No, I don't really like it much and I don't think I'll give it very long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's only been it? how long now? Four yeah, years? 282 episodes or something. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, this is 283. So. 283, there you go. Here we oh, go. Well. Yeah, no, it's great. Thank you. Always a pleasure, Andrew. Um, now, we might get stuck straight into it because this first story is uh, one that uh, I, I know uh, a few people are pretty keen on on hearing about, and that is a 16-year study into Einstein's theory of relativity and whether or not it holds up. And they found a way to test it, and they've taken 16 years to come up with the results. So where do you want to start, with the process or with the results? Uh, let's let's start with why. Because, why? Um, yeah, because the, the point about relativity is it is one of the two pillars of our understanding of the universe. Relativity teaches us about the way things behave on large scales and how gravity works. And the other theory, of course, is quantum theory, which tells us about the, the subatomic world and how particle particles interact with each other. And the problem is the two are incompatible. Mm. Um, you know, we, relativity tells us that you can look back to, to a time when all the matter and um, energy the universe was in a single point, but it breaks down completely there because it's got no answers. Uh, quantum theory says that must be what happened. Uh, so um, 
astronomers and particle physicists, I have to say, are always looking for holes in what you might call the standard model, which is our current understanding. Um, the way particle physicists do this is they, they try and find new particles. And of course, that's very important with things like dark matter, because dark matter is something whose identity we don't know. And we think it's an as yet unknown subatomic particle that might turn up in one of the world's great particle accelerators. Um, but the, uh, the the other side of it, the the study of the uh, you know the accuracy of relativity that's best done by astronomers and what you need to do is find uh, regions where there's very high gravity uh, because we think that it might be in these zones where gravity is really strong uh, or the gravitational potential is really strong that we might start to see holes in the theory um, which it would be great not you know, with with all due respect to Einstein, who was brilliant, and as as you said, he he knew his theory wasn't complete. Uh, but if we found some of that some of that stuff, um, it would be uh, it would be fantastic. Uh, one moment, <laughs> right? Sent it off. Uh, <laughs> um, if we found if we could find an error. In relativity, it would be fantastic, and Einstein would have been thrilled because mm. that would open the way for new physics, new physical processes uh, to be understood. And who knows where that might lead? You know, that's the really exciting bit. If we could tease out hidden dimensions or things of this sort, that's kind of where all this stuff is leaving, leading, I beg your pardon. All right, so the story today is ta -da, the double pulsar, uh, which itself is a unique object, uh, two pulsars in orbit around one another, uh, which uh, have been known for, for many years. Uh, what are pulsars? They are stars, that basically neutron stars, which are objects less than 20 kilometers across uh, with, you know, almost the, well, the mass of at least two stars. Uh, yeah. compressed into that size. So their density is enormous. And they have very strong magnetic fields. Uh, many of them rotate and they beam out radiation along uh, from their north and south poles. And that gives you this kind of lighthouse effect of flashing beams of radio radiation and light too in some cases. Um, and that's why they're called pulsars. Uh, so uh, the thing about pulsars, though, is that they are incredibly accurate clocks. They, they're actually better than atomic clocks in terms of their regularity. Uh, and that leads to the possibility of doing all kinds of, all kinds of physics. So what we have here is an object known as the double pulsar, uh, found actually, yes, using the Parkes Radio Telescope here in Australia in 2003. And indeed, the Parkes Radio Telescope has contributed to the observations that we're talking about. Um, it, what, what you've got is um, two stars, two neutron stars. One goes around 45 times every second, and the other goes around 2.8 times per second with a very high degree of accuracy. And the stars orbit each other once in two and a half hours. So, you know, this is amazing stuff. These two objects, when you think of them in space, orbiting once every two and a half hours, each one spinning at these insane rates of spin. And so what um, relativity says is that because these uh, there's incre incredible accelerations involved in these uh, motions, that they will actually cause gravitational waves uh, to be sent out, the ripples in space-time, and that will slow the system down. And so it, these two pulsars will do what we've already observed in some situations with LIGO, the large uh, the laser interferometer, interferometer gravitational wave observatory, and that is a co collision of these two. So we're going to look out for the collision of these two pulsars in 85 million years' time. It's quite a while. Yeah, but, I might just um, not stay awake for that. I'll, I'll... <laughs> yeah, me too. I'd do well, do well to stay awake for eight and a half years, let alone eight, 85 million years. <laughs> um, but the, the bottom line is that uh, the, the, it's the... The fact is that there is energy loss coming from this, and that is all mixed up with... Uh, with the the gravitational wave energy, you know the gravitational wave energy loss. It's mixed up with the theory of relativity, and these 
you know, these pulses of radiation uh, actually allow you to calculate the uh, the energy loss. Um, so one of the scientists is Adam Della, um, who I think might have been in touch with us, Andrew. Was that right? So I think he might have given us a, a bell a couple of weeks ago from uh, the OSGRAV, which is the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Gravitational Waves. Um, and they they actually um, have calculated when these pulses of radiation arrive. And uh, Adam says, we model the precise arrival times of more than 20 billion of these clock ticks, the pulses, Ooh. over 16 years. Um, but they've then measured the you know they've they've then measured the distances to the stars and actually uh can can sense that there is this wobble in the star's position um by actually using other telescopes in fact the very long baseline array in new mexico uh, but the bottom line uh, and the answer which everybody's on the edge of their seat uh is that uh within a precision of i think it's 99. Point is it 99.99%? Yep, that's what yes, I read. It is it 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 makes um you know it, it confirms relativity with that sort of accuracy 99.99%. So a 16 year study to prove one of the greatest minds in uh, astronomy and science wrong has failed. But yep. that's probably not the way to look at it. It it yep. reaffirms his brilliance. It does. Um, it says that relativity is such an extraordinarily complete theory. Um, there have been other tests done by other means as well, which actually give you higher levels of confidence in it. Um, you can look at accelerations in different ways and get some very, very high accuracy confirmations that relativity is correct. Uh, this is yet another one. And um, it's frustrating in a way because we really like to find a hole in relativity. Well, as you said at the very start, uh, finding a hole in relativity will open up so many other things, so many other areas of study, so much potential for learning. Yeah. And we, we, we've sort of stumbling over the fact that we're stuck on something we can't prove wrong. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's what it is. <laughs> Frustrating. And, and it doesn't answer, as you also said, the disparity between relativity and particle physics. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean the two the two interleave, but, but yeah. the, there's the quantum theory bit is the bit that uh, you know it struggles to to be compatible with relativity. Yeah, well, um, I, I know they're working very hard to try and crack the problem of um, uh, of particle physics and quantum theory, but it, it's such deep, deep, yeah. deep science. And, and isn't it intriguing that the techniques that people are using to do that? Who would have thought that two pulsars beaming around one another and spinning around their common centre of gravity would allow you to to, to do these tests of, of relativity? It's actually one of the things that excites me about the Square Kilometre Array, Andrew. That's that giant array of radio telescopes, one in Western Australia, one in South Africa. Uh, because one of the things that those telescopes will allow us to do is similar science to this using pulsars, uh, but but in even more extreme gravitational environments, which uh, the hope is that, yes, the SKA might itself reveal some flaws in relativity, which would open the way for new physics. We keep talking about it, but it just keeps showing that it's rock solid. Yeah. And uh, is it possible we may never solve it? Um. That's really depressed me, is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm I'm an optimist. Uh, yes, it is possible. Uh, because, you know, it may well be that the difference, the thing that reconciles the two theories is so difficult to detect that our instruments are just nowhere near being capable of doing that. But I'm, mm. well, you know, my career started building instruments and uh, optical instruments for telescopes and things of that sort. So I, I, I'm an optimist that the instruments will let us do it. Yeah, and as technology advances and we create um, new and better and more highly functional instruments yeah. that can 
you know, get down to the real nitty gritty of things that we couldn't even imagine 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, yeah, it, it might just make the discovery of a flaw in relativity that much easier to to find. Yes, but it might right. take it might take a long time. We might yeah. we might not crack it in the next decade. We might crack it in thirty, fifty, a hundred. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> as long as it doesn't take uh, eighty five or eighty six million years to crack yes, it, yes, I'll still be interested. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Um, it keeps keeps your brain going, uh, and it'll of course uh, prompt a batch of questions about particle physics and quantum theory. And uh, I'm sure we'll get a dark energy and a dark matter question here or there because they're they're all wrapped up in it, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. That you know, one of the big. That's how we know that these theories are not perfect because we we can't identify dark matter yet and dark energy the energy mm. of the universe yeah. but we just know they're there the, the yes science. so that all the evidence is that they're there proves yeah. it yeah yeah all right uh if you'd like to read that study it's uh, being published in all manner of uh websites and news releases but uh it's um yeah it's well worth a read i've read the whole thing 2300 pages worth <laughs> Actually, i read um, the media it? release that was yeah. that was two pages yeah <laughs> That, that's courtesy of CSIRO, the, uh, the uh, Australian Science Agency or Science Organisation. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, a, a shout out to them because they very kindly, when there's a big story like this, they, they send it our way, which is good. Yep, indeed. And, uh, you yeah, know, it was good to be able to talk about it, but uh, well worth uh, looking into if you're uh, really keen on, on uh, learning more about how they did it. And uh, even, even though we know they didn't find a flaw in the, in the, uh, theory as yet, but um, yeah, I suppose as we've been saying time and time again, watch this space. Uh, this is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Now let's take a little break from the program to talk to you about our sponsor NordVPN. Now, uh, as a Space Nuts listener, NordVPN is offering for a limited time only 73% off a two-year plan. That's a very, very good deal. And you can take advantage of that right now just because you're a Space Nuts listener. Now, there is also a 30-day money-back guarantee that in itself is pretty darn impressive. Now, if you'd like to take advantage of the offer, just uh, go to the special URL that's been created for you, which is nordvpn.com slash space nuts. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. Look over the deal, see what you think, and then give it a try. 30 days money back guarantee. And if you don't like it, you don't like it. But it is a really good service and it enables you to secure your internet access from hackers, from people trying to steal your, uh, your banking information, from people trying to get hold of your money. It also gives you that ability to access areas that are outside your geographical zone. So it, it really is a great service and, and one worth taking a look at. And look, it's going to cost you very little on a on a week by week basis so you get one month free if you buy a two-year plan and a 73 percent discount on the two-year plan so if you want to grab the deal it's nordvpn.com slash space nuts that's nordvpn.com slash space nuts and just a reminder that if you're in australia and you're looking at that url and checking out the prices they are in us dollars so um, just be aware of that. But just to give you a, 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 an idea of the cost, under this deal, as a Space Nuts listener, three dollars sixteen a month. That's US dollars. Three dollars sixteen a month. That's seventy nine dollars for two years. Normally you'd pay nearly three hundred. So check it out today at nordvpn.com slash space nut slash space nuts. <laughs> nearly got there. Now back to the show. Zero G and I feel fine. Space nuts. Thanks for joining us on Space Nuts. Uh, and now, Fred, we're going to talk about uh, this this youngish star that uh, they say gives us insight into the early solar system. This is E. K. Draconis. I love the name of it. it sounds like something out of um, oh, what was that show? Um, yeah, I can't remember. 
<laughs> Sounds like somebody's name, doesn't it? Uh, E.K. Yeah. Draconis. <laughs> mm. I quite like it. Yeah. Uh, actually, the name um, the name tells you that it's a variable star because uh, stars... Game of have... Thrones. Game of oh, Thrones. The... Yeah, I've never watched the Game of Thrones, so I can't comment on that. But yes, it, it does sound like something that will belong there. <laughs> um any star that's got two letters in front of its name and a constellation, uh, Draconis means it, it's in the constellation of Draco, which is a Northern Hemisphere constellation. Uh, but that tells you it's a variable star. That's one that is the category that uh, that astronomers use to, to to discuss them, like R R Lyrae and Delta Cephei and things like that. The uh, letter and two two sorry two letters. So Delta Cephei is not one, but anything with two letters and a constellation name after is is a variable star. Uh, and so that ties in with what we know about this object, which is relatively close by. I'm not sure it's exact distance. And it's, you know, it's measured in tens of light years rather than millions of light years. Uh, but it is a young star, a youthful star, probably less than 100 million years old. And that sounds pretty antique to we humans. But when you think our sun is about 4.57 billion years old, uh, that puts it into perspective. But we believe the sun was a bit like E.K. Dr Draconis um, when, when, you know, when it was a youngster. And so the more we can find out about stars like this, the more we can learn about the environment that the the planets faced in the earliest days uh, of the solar system. And what people have long thought is that stars like this uh, basically regularly emit these huge high-energy clouds of charged particles, of subatomic particles, which are called a coronal mass ejection. Yeah. Uh, and that's, or, or CME, uh, they we see them as as what are called flare stars. In fact, um, right at the start of my career, I, I worked with a colleague, um, Brad Carter, up in Queensland, whose uh, topic there was flare stars, uh, which was interesting because we had a the instrument I'd built to do this was called flare, but that was two different spellings of the word, uh, and um, we observed flare stars with flare, uh, and they are they're young stars of a particular type. So uh, E. K. Draconis is one of these. We know that they flare in energy. That's why it's known as a variable star. But we now have much more, uh, you know, sophistication in the instruments at our disposal. Just as you were saying in relation to uh, gravitational waves and understanding relativity, uh, we've got things like TESS, the NASA Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Uh, yeah. And we've got other big telescopes equipped with uh, actually very sensitive equipment like spectrographs for measuring things that like velocity. And what they these observers, and this is a group led uh, by scientists in the USA, uh, is uh, that, the, and, uh, actually in the University of Colorado, I think that's uh, where some of the authors are from, uh, what they've done is they've used TESS uh, and found a, a, basically a flare uh, of light. Uh, and in fact, they call it a super flare because it was very bright. But then mm. they followed up with an observation that essentially allowed them to see this cosmic, sorry, coronal mass ejection heading our way from the star's surface uh, at about 440 kilometers per second, uh, something how, like that. How far away is this thing? Its, it's distance is measured in tens of light years. I don't have a, uh, a, an exact figure because I didn't bother looking it up, which I should have done because I knew you'd ask that question. <laughs> uh, but it, look, it's, it's, it's far enough away that this is not going to affect us, Andrew. Uh, but any planets in orbit around E.K. Draconis could well get drenched in these subatomic particles. Um, and, you know, uh, the, 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 lots of things could fry, uh, particularly if said planets have any intelligent species of life on them who have mm -hmm. developed electronics and electricity uh, because that literally fries. And, uh, in fact, one of the, the biggest events of this kind that has been recorded uh, on Earth 
Uh, I think you and I have spoken about it before. It happened in September 1859. I remember it well. Yes. Uh, and it's called the Carrington event. Uh, it, so September 1859, we were nowhere near in the world as dependent on electronics as we are today, but it still caused telegraph lines, you know, in the United States where this newfangled telegraph was coming into being, the telegraph lines just basically caught fire uh, because they they got very hot and were, you know, near the, 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 the wooden poles and the insulators. Mm. Uh, it actually... Uh, it destroyed uh, quite a lot of the of the youthful network of te telegraphs that were growing up, probably here in Australia as well, uh, but certainly in the USA, that was where the biggest effects were, um, and that's the kind of thing that would happen. That was the biggest uh, event and a suspected cause. Uh, coronal mass ejection uh, known to have hit the earth almost certainly bigger ones will have hit in the past and certainly in the in, in the sun's youth uh, when it was delivering these things all the time uh, so it's uh, it's a, a salutary lesson uh, by observing ek draconis that we can that we can find um, kind of what happens the thinking that uh, comes about, and I should have said this outburst I just mentioned was in April 2020, um, mm -hmm. the thinking is that it was more than 10 times bigger than the, the Carrington event, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we might not face one. So it behoves our electrics, electrical and electronic engineers to bear in mind that one day you could have this flux of subatomic particles that could uh, blow fuses everywhere. It, uh, it, it certainly... Uh, is very relevant to space communications because spacecraft are, of course, they're outside, well, the ones that are outside the magnetosphere of the Earth, which is the geostationary satellites, they are like, they would be first cab off the rank in getting fried. Um, mm. And that's why these spacecraft are often, uh, there's, there's often quite a bit of what you might call armoring. It's, you know, it's not quite lead, but that sort of thing to try and protect the electronics from the uh, intense um, radiation field that they're in. Yeah, I, to um, try and help people understand how very real the threat is to electronics on Earth of um, some kind of CME, it is something that emergency authorities around the world are actually gearing up for yeah. because there is always the danger that we will get clobbered by one of these things. And it doesn't have to be the, the size of the one we were just talking about uh, on, the, uh, on the star Draconis. But, um, and as you said, it's, it's unlikely our sun will ever do anything that big, but you can't absolutely write off the possibility. Uh, but, um, yeah, CMEs are a big threat to us now because of our reliance on electronics. That, that Carrington event, uh, yeah, it affected um, telegraph lines. But now we have so many things that are attached to an electrical grid that are day-to-day -day factors in our lives that we are so 100% reliant on, including what you and I are doing right now. Yes, exactly. A big coronal mass ejection direct hit uh, could uh, completely wipe out some of the grids and cause extensive and billions of dollars worth of damage. That's worst case scenario. But emergency authorities, even the authorities in this little town that I live in, have been looking at this as a potential yeah. problem in, in the future and, and um, that it needs to be something that we factor into future emergency uh, uh, coverage and, and 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 dealing with the potential fallout from from the loss of widespread electronic reliance and uh, it, it does make you sort of pause for a moment because we take so much for granted and at yeah you know, at a at the, at the whim of the sun, it could all just be taken away from us and um, we need to really consider the possibility. And, you know, the other day, uh, probably about a month ago, I was just sort of scouring through some websites and I saw this little banner, uh, emergency banner on, on a website and I thought, oh, what's this? And it was, in fact, a, um, um, a warning about a potential coronal mass ejection event that could affect electronics in the northern hemisphere there you go so yeah. you know it's already yeah uh something that's being taken quite seriously yeah and you um, you're a follower of the space weather 
website yeah, as well. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, this is all what we call space weather today. It was certainly um, 50 years ago, nobody would ever dreamt of talking about space weather, but that's what we've got. We've got this environment that the Earth is in that has stuff mostly coming from the sun that causes changes in the uh, in the, the flux of particles. So, yes, something hard really hitting us uh, would cause damage, and it's right for people to be aware of it. So, I, I, I mean, it's a good news story when you, you, know, you know that uh, authorities are actually cognizant of this, that they might need to deal with a situation where the world's electronics are effectively wiped out. Mm. It could happen. Yeah. yeah, don't ever write off the possibility. There are so yeah. many things that uh, we we just don't even think about, but uh, there are people who are thinking about it and looking for ways around it. So that's uh, reassuring. But uh, yeah, learning the the potential uh, of things uh, through observation of stars like this is uh, is certainly a, a, a great way to get ourselves ahead of the the curve in terms of uh, dealing with future potential problems. Most likely won't, but never say never, uh, and that's kind of where we're at. So uh, we'll move on from that, Fred, uh, to Comet Lenny. I'm calling it Comet <laughs> Lenny. Con Comet uh, Leonard could be Leonard. We're not well, sure, but uh, this one's uh, hurtling towards us now. And a couple of things that are, are very interesting about this particular comet, and for those in the northern hemisphere, uh, hemisphere, bad luck, it's going to drop out of your vision, and uh, we in the southern hemisphere will get a really good look at it in the next week or two. That's correct. Uh, so it's been known about since the beginning of the year, actually. It was discovered by astronomer Greg Leonard. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, it, uh, astronomers always take the names... Sorry. Comets always take the names of their discoverers, so starting with Halley and working upwards. Um, it's an object uh, which has come from the depths of the solar system. It's in an orbit that is very, very stretched. Uh, at its furthest, it would be 3,700 times further away from the sun than we are, which is way, way out, almost at the, at the level of the Oort cloud, not quite. It's probably... Uh, not the first time this comet's come into the central of the solar system, but it's a rare visitor. Uh, and it has kind of brightened up um, and become relatively visible within the Northern Hemisphere over the last couple of weeks or so. It's about a kilometre across its nucleus. Uh, and of course, comets, as we've said many times before, comets are like cats. They have tails and do anything they like. Uh, <laughs> and um, the, uh, the the thing about comets is, yes, you can predict sort of where they're going to go because they uh, they act under the gravity of the sun and the other planets. But you can't predict whether they're going to become particularly bright. And hmm. so... Um, and, and that's true. Uh, last time Halley's Comet was here in the late 80s, it didn't really do what everyone thought it would do. It was very disappointing actually, uh, from, from, a, from a naked eye point of view. Yeah, although we did know that back in 1910, uh, when yeah. it was here last time. It's because it was on the wrong side of the sun. Uh, but you're right, you, you, can't, you can't predict. Uh, and one of the things you can't predict is uh, a comet, quite often a comet, looks um, quite promising as it comes in from the outer solar system, starts brightening up as it gets near the sun and then falls to bits under the effects of the sun's gravity. Um, breaks and apart. that might happen to this one. Yes, there's there's a worry that it might. Um, it's, it's, however, as far as we know, it's hanging together and will appear in southern skies from about the 17th of December, uh, a few days' time, so um, hopefully anybody in the Northern Hemisphere who's got the wherewithal to, to, to find it, and you can easily find where it is by Googling the name, uh, it, will be, uh, it will be worth a look. Its closest to Earth is 12th of December. Uh, uh, that's now gone. Uh, so yep. it's on its way away from Earth, but uh, is not yet closest to the sun. I think it gets closest to the sun uh, on the 3rd of January, that's that's its uh, closest approach. So I also read that when it gets near Venus, it'll be the closest in recorded history uh, that a comet has ever been to Venus. Yes, that's right. Uh, Four million kilometres uh, yeah. of Venus. That, if you're on Venus and you could see through the terrible atmosphere that Venus has got, it would be a spectacular sight. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it will be very spectacular. Um, actually, you know, one of the nice things is that uh, we w- Venus is pretty obvious in our skies at the moment. Uh, it's the brightest thing in the early evening sky. It's drawing closer to the sun in the sky as it passes between the Earth and the sun, which it will do at the end of the month. Uh, but Comet Leonard is pretty close to Venus in the sky, so it's a good guide uh, to try and find it. Uh, and I'll be looking if the skies are clear on the 18th of December uh, or thereabouts, uh, 17th or 18th, I'll have the binoculars out looking for an object uh, to the s- sort of to the south of Venus um, and try and find it. And I'll Fantastic. let you know. <laughs> uh, there's something for all the, the sky watchers and am- amateur astronomers that uh, want to see if they can get a, a good view of uh, Comet Leonard. This is Space Nuts. You're with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Roger, you're live through here also. Space Nuts. A reminder, if you'd like to become a patron, jump on our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io and click on the supporter link. And you can become a patron through Patreon, through Supercast, or you can just buy us a cup of coffee. There's a link specifically there that says buy us a cup of coffee. So if you want to do that, those are the options available. And thank you to all of those who recently signed up for uh, Patreon because, uh, yeah, our numbers are growing and that is fantastic. And don't forget, I think there's still a 30-day trial for Patreon and Supercast, so you can sign up, you can decide whether or not you like it. And if you do, great. If you don't, that's fine too. Uh, It's all uh, explained on our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Uh, now, Fred, we've got some questions to go through. We're going to do a couple of text questions and finish off with an audio question. And uh, this first one comes from Ben in Port Lincoln, South Australia. Hi, Fred and Andrew. I really enjoy your show and look forward to each new episode. I have a question about the energy in the universe. Have they tried to estimate how much there is? Do they, scientists, think that there is new energy being made? And we can't have a question that doesn't involve black holes. So if black holes <laughs> suck everything in, have they found or are they looking for the opposite to a black hole? Thanks again for your great show. And, Andrew, if you ever come to Port Lincoln, I'll be keen for a round of golf. Ooh, <laughs> is that a threat? Uh, yeah, that, that'd be great. Um, thank you, Ben. Uh, I, we are in South Australia in February, but I don't think we're getting anywhere near Port Lincoln, but um, maybe one day. You might have to so make the a first part of his trip. question was about the energy of the universe. Uh, is there new energy being created? And uh, yeah, um, you know, how much is there? <laughs> um, actually, the it is a really interesting question that's got a fairly complex answer. But the overall energy of the universe is probably wait for it, Andrew, zero. Ta-da. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, I don't um, know why. But. Um, and, and it comes about. Um, it almost sounds like you know spreadsheet economics, but the the yes, there are ten to, about ten to the power eighty particles in the observable universe, and these are subatomic particles mostly. It's not as big a number as you might expect, mm. um, and they have got colossal amounts of energy because E equals mc squared. So these particles are, uh, have huge amounts of energy. Um, and if you think of light or uh, electromagnetic energy, matter and antimatter, they all have their own energy, uh, which is often called positive energy. Um, but there is a sort of opposite of this, something like something that's called negative energy. And that essentially is stored in the you know it's the way that it's the gravitational attraction that exists between all the positive energy particles uh, which balances the negative force and so the the answer is on this sort of arithmetic there is no universe uh en- energy at all <laughs> So you know, it sounds crazy. Um, there is uh, the, the the source that I've, I've been reading about this quotes Stephen Hawking uh, in his Theory of Everything book to explain the concept of negative en- energy. And I'm quoting now from the book: two pieces of matter that are close to each other have less positive energy than the same two pieces a long way apart 
because you have to expend energy to separate them against the gravitational force that is pulling them together. And that gravitational force is what the negative energy is. So it's, it is a bit counterintuitive that you'd think that two pieces of matter close together would have more energy than if they were a long way apart. Um, but it's all about the energy that you have to, you have to expend to separate them. So it's a, mm. quite a nice analog. So it is a, it is a, a, it's a, yes, it's a, it's a difficult area to talk about without bringing in the mathematics. Um, I might actually try and quote another um, pair of astrophysicists, and I think this is from one of their books. It's uh, Alexei Filipenko and Jay Pasahoff, uh, both uh, US scientists, well-known ones. They explain gravity's negative energy, uh, and it's actually not a book, it's in an essay, which is called A Universe from Nothing. Uh, they explain it like this. If you drop a ball from rest... Uh, which is defined to be a state of zero energy. It gains energy of motion, which is kinetic energy, as it falls. But this is exactly balanced by the larger negative gravitational energy as it comes closer to the Earth's centre. So the sum of those two energies remains zero. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so that's the first part of Ben's question. The second yes. part... Are they looking for the opposite of a black hole, which I think we've had questions about before. Are we, are we looking for a white hole? I that's think right. yeah. yeah. So a white hole is what you get when you take the relativistic equations that define a black hole and you make time negative. You make time flow the other way. Uh, and what you get is a white hole. And there's no physical reason why that should not exist. Um, the, the, the mathematics works. A white hole, uh, whereas a black hole sucks things in and won't let anything out, uh, a white hole spews things out but won't let anything in. <laughs> uh, but the bottom line is uh, a white hole has never been observed. There is no mm. astrophysical object that could be deemed to be a white hole. So it may well be that these things are prevented from existing somehow. And the, the, while the mathematics are terribly elegant and work well, uh, they don't reflect reality. Okay. Interesting. Uh, that is until we find one. Until we find uh, one, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Ben, and happy golfing. Uh, let's move on to John, who is in the good state of New South Wales. Just wondering why the James Webb, uh, Webb Telescope was shipped to French Guiana to be launched. I've seen a couple of reasons, such as it uses less fuel to launch at the equator and it's part of ESA's contribution to the project. Maybe it's a bit of both. Love your podcast. Thanks, John. Has he answered his own question? <laughs> yes, he has. John, you're right on the money with both of those. So uh, ESA's main launch site is there, not very far from the equator. And, of course, the reason why you want to launch satellites into orbit from the equator is because you're taking... Uh, advantage of the Earth's rotation, which gives uh, uh, at the equator about a 1,600 kilometre an hour additional free gift in the velocity that you need to, to go into orbit. Uh, yep. So that's that's what it's all about, the, the, mm -hmm. exactly as you've said, both of those reasons. Okay, easy peasy, John. I, I read an article today about whether or not humanity will ever ch achieve 1% of light speed, and it was really interesting because they tried to explain how you could achieve it. And, um, you know, they came up with ideas going forward about warp drive and using light sails, which they reckon could ultimately achieve 10% of light speed in a, a nuclear fusion as a, as a propulsion system. But uh, the problem with uh, achieving 1% light speed uh, is uh, the energy required. And you and I have talked about if you wanted to achieve light speed, there's not enough energy in the universe to do it. Quite. And to achieve 1% of light speed, they said you would need to expend the same amount of energy as uh, 2 million human beings would expel in a day. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's the energy required to reach 1% of light speed. Yeah. So getting a gravity um, boost or a, or a boost by launching at the equator makes a hell of a lot of sense when you, when you know what sort of energy is involved in just getting to the speed you need to get out of the, um, out of the Earth's atmosphere. So 
Uh, it's all relative. Boom, boom. Uh, uh, let's uh, go to our next question. This one comes from James in Cincinnati. Hello, Mr. Dunkley and Professor Watson. James from Cincinnati, USA, and I've got some odd questions. I haven't heard y'all speak much, if at all, about odd radio circles, which were discovered using your very own ASCAP, and I wanted to know the good professor's thoughts on the subject. What do you think could be the source of them? They all appear to be encircling galaxies, so would it be likely that supermassive black holes are the cause? If so, why don't we see more of them since supermassive black holes seem to be the center of all galaxies? A few of them do not appear to have galaxies, at least visible to us at their center. Do you think the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to tease out any information to this odd mystery? Thanks. Love your show. It gets me through my daily work commute. Thank you, James. And go the Bengals, my favorite American football team. And uh, James, great radio voice, by the way, I might add. That's, uh, <laughs> you sound great. Okay, odd radio circles. I think we have come across these before, but we haven't spoken about them in a while. No, that's right. Uh, and they're a great advert for the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, a radio telescope array in Western Australia, which is a pathfinder for the Square Kilometre Array, uh, operated by CSIRO. Once again, uh, we're bookending this uh, segment with uh, CSIRO, the Australian, um, Australian Science Agency. Uh, so they were detected back in 2019 um, from a, a it's basically one of the pilot surveys of something called EMU, which is a great uh, Australian name, uh, and it's an acronym for the Evolutionary Map of the Universe. Uh, and it, it's basically those data have come from ASCAP. Uh, it's it's um, This was only the pilot survey, so it wasn't the, the final EMU. This was just things that were, you know, the, 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 the sky that was being studied uh, just to check that all was good for the for the main survey and these things turned up uh, uh the astronomer who discovered them was anna kapinska uh but one of the astronomers who's written a lot about them and i suspect who chose the name because that is very much the kind of person he is is a good friend of mine ray norris uh now with the university of western or with western sydney university um uh, formerly of CSIRO, uh, and that's how odd radio circles sounds like a very a very Ray name. Uh, what are they? Well, exactly what they are. They are um, circles, circular features, roughly circular features uh, in radio uh, waves, um, which are brighter along their edges, and as James mentioned, often have a galaxy at their centre. Mm. Uh, and that's interesting because you know it's well anything that's bright around its edges speaks of it possibly being a bubble uh, because if you look at a bubble uh you know a bubble that you you blow from soap or something like that uh all you see is its edges uh yep. you don't see the near and far sides not normally anyway um so bubbles show up uh are often as brighter around their edges but it, it's it, the problem is that they are quite big these are typical typically one minute of arc in diameter that's a uh you know a minute of arc is what it's the 16th uh sorry it's a it's a, a 30th of the diameter no it's not it's a <laughs> It's a 15th of the diameter of the moon. Do the sums properly, Fred. The moon's about half a degree in diameter, uh, which is 30 minutes of arc. So half of that would be uh, 15. What did I say? I can't remember. Anyway, one arc minute. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a small amount, a 30th of the diameter of the moon. There you are. I'll get the right answer eventually. Um, so they're big. Uh, and if it's a shock wave or, you know, something to do with an energetic event like a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy, um, it would have taken a long, long time for these things to get to the size. Um, so the, the, the problem is that the studies that have been done don't really seem to fit any of the, the things that you would expect, fast radio bursts or a gamma ray burst or, you know, a, 
supernova remnant, something of that sort that's typically spherical or often mm. spherical, or or even a planetary nebula, which is the the shell that forms around an old star of the same sort of size as the sun is. That's what our sun will do eventually, form one of these planetary nebulae. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing. And I'm not an expert on odd radio circles, but I don't think the science has progressed really all that far, apart from the fact that several have been discovered. It may even be more than 10 now. Yeah. Uh, bright at radio va- ra- wavelengths, not visible at visible infrared or X-ray wavelengths. It's fascinating. So, James, thank you for reminding mm. us that there are things in the universe that we simply don't yet understand. Yeah, plenty of them. <laughs> yeah, plenty of them yeah. I mean, the yeah. alignment of galaxies in their centres could be... It could simply be uh, an accident. You know, you've just got, I think, uh, uh, three of them have galaxies at their centres, um, which, you know, would associate them, you would think, with the galaxies, but that might be a chance alignment. We, we don't know. Yeah. These things might be in the foreground. Yeah, coinky dink. Yeah, yeah coinky dink. That's right. Indeed. Indeed. All right, so, James, lovely to hear from you, and thank you for your question, odd as it was. Uh, and by the way, Fred, uh, EK Draconis is 111.32 light years from Earth. <laughs> what did I say? A few tens of light years away. A few you? tens of light years. Yeah. It's 11 tens of light years. It, it is. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for, for, for looking it up. Mm, no problem. Uh, that brings us to the end. Don't forget, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, visit our website and you can send us an email uh, or you can send us a voice message or you can send us a voice question. Just... Um, Log on to spacenutspodcast.com and click on the um, the AMA tab or the send us a question uh, link on the right-hand side of the homepage. Whatever you want to do, we'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from. And while you're online, visit the Space Nuts shop because there's all sorts of goodies like that. <laughs> That's the Space Nuts sticker. Uh, or um, I, I saw a bucket hat the other day uh, while I was scrolling through the, the list of things. There's all sorts of goodies on the Space Nuts shop. It's not too late to order for Christmas. It won't turn up till next Christmas, but you can still do it. <laughs> yeah. uh, or maybe just get yourself something so that you can be a proud Space Nut and wear your badge with honour. Uh, that brings us to the end of another show, Fred. Thank you so much. Great pleasure, Andrew. Always good. And um, I think we'll be talking next week by the sound of we things. We will. Too. Yes, we will indeed. Good to catch up. See you soon. That is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts, and back to Hugh in the studio, who's got a lot of patchwork to do on this episode. <laughs> got to tell you. So you didn't think anything went wrong. Uh, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you so much for joining us. We'll catch you on the very next episode. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.